You could open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. It is often assumed when people learn that I am a minister that I am an expert in religion. <laughs> and not just one religion, but all of the religions. <laughs> When touring a mosque this summer in Spain, my husband turned to me with like a glimmer in his eye because he knew the response. He said, yes, Emily, why don't you tell us what the Quran says on that issue? <laughs> <laughs> so you should know I've got grown quite comfortable dis just disappointing people over and over <laughs> For some, religion is about answering the questions we sang earlier in this service. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? For me, religion is about learning how to live with one another. <clears throat> Pastor Peter Steinke says, I find the belligerence with which creationists and evolutionary theorists debate the biblical creation story a waste of energy. I don't think the Hebrew, Hebrew writer of Genesis or the readers of Genesis were drawn into the question of creation's how, or how long? The Hebrews were more interested, it seems to me, he says, in relationships that eventually culminated in covenant. They addressed the connection between the divine and the human and the relationships between one another. In fact, the ensuing biblical stories center around the tension between two brothers, about welcoming the stranger, being sensitive to the plight of the marginal, the violation of personal boundaries again and again and again, and seeking shalom, the flourishing of life for all. Simply put, Steinke says, relationships count, and that is the central narrative. So given that, I wish I could also tell you that I was at least an expert in human relationships. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, they really baffle me. <laughs> People come to me all the time and I'll go, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and not only like our personal relationships, but like how humanity learns to live together. Today is a great day for that question. We don't know how to live together. And we don't know how to live apart. Isolation is not working for us. So that's where I sing the line, mystery, mystery, life is a riddle and a mystery. For instance, recently I received an email from the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association, okay? So this is all my fellow ministers, in which they are confronting what we are facing as colleagues, as partners. And it's some very relational work. And in the email, it said that our task was demand, dismantling white supremacy culture. It was uncovering the impact of trauma in our communities. It was learning how to deal with conflict and accountability, and it was settling the questions of authority and responsibility. Two of the letter signers of this email are two very close friends of mine from seminary. We graduated in the same class together, having spent four years together. And I wrote them back and said, thank you so much for this letter. That is exactly right. And wow, is that all we have to do? <laughs> Dismantle white supremacy culture, learn how to deal with conflict, um, deal with our trauma. You know, and like, I was like, I am, I am really trying hard right now to not hide underneath my desk. As a leader, how do we do this? We suck at this. <laughs> so every once in a while when I'm hiding underneath my desk, when humanity feels particularly grim, I binge watch episodes of West Wing. <laughs> I know some of you don't know, but it's the TV drama of the White House in the early 2000s where Jeb Bartlett is the president. <laughs> I, know, I know it says a lot about me, not all things that I like, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to admit it. But it just takes the opening chords of the opening theme song for me to stir my most like nostalgic, uh, patriotic of uh, spirits. And recently, my uh, colleague Kimberly Dubus reminded me of a specific West Wing scene 
President Jeb Bar Bartlett has just returned from a trip to India with gifts for his staff, namely games, but particularly a chessboard. And so while the staff deals with this massive international crisis and they are waiting up for early New Hampshire primary results, President Bartlett sits there and plays a game of chess with Sam Seaborn, his deputy communications director. And Sam is watching the president and wonders aloud, how do you do it? Meaning, how do you stay so calm in the midst of this chaos? And with his eyes on the game, President Bartlett replies, I see the whole board. I think what we need to do right now is see the whole board. If Unitarian Universalists seek to build the beloved community, that's what we talk about. If we believe in values like freedom, equality and equity, dignity, sustainability, it will require that we hold a larger vision in the midst of chaos. It will require that we not just see the next move, but we, that we see the next 10 moves, realizing that the game is complex and constantly shifting. Over the last three months, I have read with veracity a detective series based on the character of Macy Dobbs. Any Macy Dobbs? Right, no one. <laughs> <laughs> few months. I have been talking about her nonstop, so <laughs> apologies, now it's all to you. But she's a psychologist and investigator, not just a mere detective, a psychologist and investigator, and she's living and working in 1930s London. Each of the crimes that Maisie investigates are immersed in the human psychological trauma that was caused by the First World War. I mean, amazing. And it's Maurice Blanche, just to give you another little Pull. Maurice Blanche is Maisie's own personal French Yoda. I mean, he really is Yoda. <laughs> and he teaches her the wisdom of humanity. And funny enough, I think it's in the 1930s where I have seen what's at stake for us and why we must take this long view of human relationships. The author, Jacqueline Winspear, grew up in the county of Kent, England, near her grandfather, who was severely wounded and shell-shocked in the Battle of Somme in 1916. Beginning in her childhood, Winspear was drawn to understand this war to end all wars, not because she wanted to understand the time period, but because she wanted to understand her grandfather and why he was the way he was. Have you ever had a family member that you think, what did they go through that caused them to be like this? It was a generation who lost its innocence in the Great War. And to go on living with that trauma lays the foundation for the future. This generation will have to face a period of chaos, a Great Depression that leaves soldiers without an adequate medical care, that puts a spotlight on the suffering of the all too many have nots, while also showcasing the all too few haves. It will be an era in which the rise of fascism will seek to be a call to end that suffering, but really, but really is a way to use human resentment in order to gain power. And then there's the very real prospect of war after just having finished one, of human being fighting human being, both in the West and in the East, and a war where parents who were lucky enough to survive the first one will face having to send their children into the next. I can't imagine. And yet, we live in the time that we live in. The questions become, will they bury their heads in the sand? Will they give in to the false promises of a narcissistic dictator? What are they going to stand for? The mystery genre, says Jacqueline Winspear, provides a wonderful vehicle for exploring such a time. Because you get the underbelly. You get to see how trauma plays out. Now, mystery genre. We are not using the word mystery here to explain merely who done it. 
We are using it in its Greek form, mythikos, meaning to enter into the mystery that is human relationship. Because when human beings are faced with such multiplying anxieties, anyone living in anxiety all the time? We can't see the options. We cannot see the chessboard. We can barely see what's in front of us. We become paralyzed, and thus we sink into our most instinctive survival skills. And we forfeit that which makes us human, our power to reflect. And it makes human relationships pretty pathetic. Now I say this to you, of course that's the big scheme, but let's talk about our lives. I love one particular story told by Anne Lamont, partly because it's just so funny, but just so real. And so I want you to know two things about the writer Anne Lamont, if you don't already know. She is a recovering alcoholic, and she endeavors to live the teachings of Jesus. She is a woman of principles. So her story begins as she is driving by a carpet store. And somehow, as she's driving by, she spots in the window up against the wall a sea foam green plush carpet. And in that moment, she's like, that's going to be so perfect for my Sunday school room, the room that I teach in. I really want to get that. So she pulls over, and minutes later, she's got the rug, and she's paid the money, and she's taken it off to her church. Now, why she doesn't open the rug at the store is a mystery to me. I'm just going to let that go. There are several things about this story I have to let go. But she takes it, they unravel it, they put it down on the nursery room floor, and there is a huge moldy spot. Oh. Right, right. And so they have to roll it back up, take it back to the carpet store, and thus begins a several-day complex conflict with the salesman at the store for $50, okay? First, the salesman makes an excuse to Anne Lamont about why he cannot reimburse her. His accountant's not there. You'll have to come back tomorrow. So when Anne returns the next day, he tells her that somebody already picked up the $50, and he points to the ledger. It's right here. And they both hold out their palms. This is a mystery. The universal sign of being amiably perplexed. And she says, I was not particularly tweaked at this point. I felt that there had been a simple misunderstanding, and we could clear it up that if you are sincere, if you're rational, if you're trusting, everything sorts itself out. Don't you think that sometimes? Like, if I'm just rational, human relationships will work out. <laughs> right? Uh-huh. So the salesman is not helpful by any means. And when Anne sees this, she pulls out her sternest Sunday school voice. Uh huh. You're lying. I'm calling your bluff. Nobody picked up the money. He just taps his ledger. Okay. It's right here. That ledger doesn't mean anything, she says. I'm from a Sunday school. That's for little children. <laughs> and then she just adds for good measure, with asthma. <laughs> <laughs> he waves her away, not doing anything. And that's when she becomes furious, as furious as she can ever remember being. Have you ever had a moment where you were rational one minute and furious the next? <laughs> well, that's where she is. So let's return in this moment back to the definition of mystery, because mythikos has two definitions. It's opening ourselves up to the mystery, but you can't open yourself if, you, if your senses, like Anne's, are on fire which is what is happening right now. They are on fire. So the other definition of mythikos is to shut one's senses, to close them off. Not as in shutting down, but just having a breath, a pause. Every parent of a toddler who counts to 10 is reconnecting with their humanness. <laughs> one, two, three. Why are you counting, mommy? I don't want to kill you. <laughs> this is a task that Maisie Dobbs regularly utilizes. I mean, a 1930s psychologist investigator, as a daily practice, she takes her cushion off her couch and sits down for five minutes and breathes. And Winsbear writes, she dips into the well of silence to access the counsel of her inner knowing. 
She lets go of her lizard brain and reconnects to what it means to be human. The Buddhists teach us to practice a pause. Before we decide the meaning of another person's action, we have to pause. Are we sure that what we think is happening is actually happening? Are we sure? Is something else at play here? If X is actually happening, can we live with it? Can we let it go? Or is it something that we have to talk about? Taking the time to answer those questions is important. It matters greatly because it creates space for mystery to show up. Breathe, breathe out. Now just notice that for a moment when you breathe in, when you take a deep breath in, there's a pause right there before you breathe out. That pause is really important. And it's something you can take into your life because that's all it takes. Let's see. So let's go back to Anne Lamont and see how a pause helps her. She takes her pause in this interaction with the salesman and she says it has taken her like 11 years of sobriety in order to gain five seconds of a pause just to see how hard this can be. But she imagines Jesus in the store with her and she knows that Jesus thinks that we're all sort of like nuts and suspicious and petty and like full of crazy hungers and that it can feel awful. She knows that about Jesus and yet Jesus reminds her to be decent. So she wants to be decent. And that, in that moment, that's when the light of heaven shines down upon her and she and the salesman smile at one another and agree he hands her the $50 and they decide to become the best of friends. Just like that, it only took that pause. Yeah, right? Yeah. 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 It's in a book, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what happens to you all? Yeah, no. No. She responds with kindness, and he rolls his eyes at her, which is like the number one dismissive response in human interaction of every culture. Rolling your eyes is terrible. I live with one who rolls his eyes. <laughs> she writes, in that moment, the door to the most primitive place inside me opened, then and there, where where the betrayed child lives, terrified, wounded, and murderous. And on top of that, <laughs> on top of that I felt a deep, familiar self-loathing. The inevitable side, of, side effect of feeling angry and vulnerable and small and glaring at each other, I found all that angry energy kind of heady, like a drug. The door to the most primitive place your lizard brain. Anne Lamont in that moment behaves very badly. She might have thrown the F-bomb. She definitely imagined choking him to death. Now she didn't do it. She walked out. She sits outside in the sun, she breathes, and she just begins to laugh. <laughs> to laugh at it all, and as she laughs, she lets go of that primitive place. She takes her pause, am I sure that what is happening is happening? And if he is cheating on me, can cheat on me, cheating me, can I live with it? Who do I want to be in this moment? Deep inside, she writes, I felt that I got it. I didn't get that delicious taste of release I've been expecting when a wrong has been righted, but I got something better. I got a kind of miracle. I stopped hating myself. I stopped hating myself. Closing her senses allowed her to open to the mystery that lie, that was hidden. It was a wonder of wonders, and this is the mystery here, the wonder. The carpet guy had cheated me, but he was also an innocent bystander in a very old story. He was the smudged ledger inside of me every time I had been humiliated. I wonder how often our reactions to other people are connected to our own hurts that aren't even a part of this moment. Our own hurts that make us react and say, I'm going to hurt you before you hurt me. After a few moments, she said, I knew what to do. I bought a bouquet of daisies. I wrote him a note. I said, I'm very sorry for the way I behaved. And Lamont. 
and she leaves the bouquet and the note outside of the closed store. Now, I might have just left it at that. In fact, I probably would have left the store and just like left the $50 and been like, whatever. But that's not Anne. She calls him on the phone. Yeah. And she says, hi, this is Anne Lamont. And there's this silence, like loud and dark. And he said, I got your letter. That was a decent thing to do. And just as she begins to savor his words in this moment, he says, but you behaved badly. <laughs> I, I behaved badly and the rage starts up in her again. <laughs> but this time it didn't take over because something else got there first, her humanity. Yes, I know, she said, I behaved badly. And she let go of being right. She let go of her hurt, she forgave herself. And she just left it there. I love this story because she doesn't actually let it go for so long. She just keeps walking right into it and trying to be her best self, but then being her worst self and then keep trying. And that's what I feel like, that's why humanity baffles me because we keep walking into it and wondering what we should do. And the only thing that I can tell you we have to remember to reconnect to our humanity. Because when we walk out of these doors, we meet people on the street, we meet people in our work, we meet people on the nightly news, we have people that we love in our homes, our parents, our partners, our kids, our adult kids, our friends, and it's messy. We want so badly for it to be easy, but it's just messy. And Anne Lamott reminds us that we might live in the age of the jerk, but the age of the jerk only thrives when we allow it to. And there's another way. Maisie Dobbs reminds us that we have to try even though we hate it, even though it's hard, even though it makes us uncomfortable, even though it requires us to face our own dragons, we have to face it because there's so much at stake in our time. When the world is going crazy, when everyone's being mean and cruel to one another, we have to remember who we want to be. And so I leave you with one image. This is a painting done by Georgia O'Keeffe. It's called The Sky Above the Clouds, and she was in a plane looking out at the New Mexico, Arizona skyscape and looking at these clouds that looked like pancakes. I think it looks like a chessboard. We have to remember the larger picture of who we want to be as human beings. And what I love about this, and what George O'Keefe loved about this, what she was most interested in was the space between the clouds. In order to get to that place on the horizon, we need to remember the pause, the beat between our breaths that connects us to being human. George's painting is a visual representation of a poem by David Breeden. I dug and dug deeper into the earth, looking for blue heaven, choking always on piles of dust rising. Then once at midnight, I slipped and fell into the sky. I slipped and fell into the sky. All religions point to this place of wonder that happens in human relationships when everything's not perfect and everything is hard, but you still find the mystery there. We have to live from that place. We have to show up with bouquets of flowers even when we were right. We have to speak our needs and listen to the needs of others. We have to say we're sorry for how we behaved. And Lamont says we're invited more deeply into this mystery on a daily basis to be here as one of many, a mess like everyone else. 
So yes, relationships baffle me, but I'm keeping my eyes on the horizon. I know who I want to be. I want to be Cuban because that's where the wonder is. We are one world, one voice, one heart beating. We are one world, one voice, one heart beating. We are one world, one voice, one heart.